So I was recently diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm not really sure what to do at my job. I want to tell my boss, but I'm worried she's going to start treating me differently. On the other hand, I could say nothing and just hope for the best, but I'm scared I might be digging myself into a hole. I'm not really sure what to do, but I can't stop thinking about it, and I'm exhausted. Hi, I'm Dr. Steven Stein, clinical psychologist, emotional intelligence expert, and founder of MHS, a leading publisher of scientific psychological assessments and talent development solutions. If you're struggling to keep up at work, you don't need to suffer in silence. Let's discuss ways we can make our office more inclusive for all working styles. As a clinical psychologist, I'll be the first to admit, navigating ADHD can be complex. Not just because it's hard to diagnose or treat, but because it can show up so differently in each person. And social media has been adding to this. Apps like TikTok have been great at spreading awareness of ADHD symptoms and experience, but that comes with a risk of a lot of misinformation. So what does this mean for the workplace? We need to create a space that is catered to our employees' working preferences. By focusing on adaptability and actually asking our employees what they need from us, we'll help them be their best selves and to be most effective at work. Today's guest not only has an incredible story, but she's also an expert at helping organizations create ADHD-friendly workplaces. Kathy Rashidian is a certified executive coach specializing in ADHD in the workplace. She's combined over 20 years of leadership experience with her personal ADHD journey. Her coaching merges traditional techniques with ADHD specific strategies. And we got to talk to her about all the ways that organizations can support neurodiverse employees. Okay, Kathy, it's great to meet you and welcome to our podcast. I'm looking forward to hearing about your story. Why don't you uh, start off by just sharing a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the work you do at Ready, Set, Shoes. Sure. Thank you, Steve, so much for um, having me on your show. A little bit about me and actually through this conversation, uh, I'll trickle in my story uh, as we go. But at a high level, as you mentioned, I'm Kathy Rashidian. I am an executive coach uh, trained with my own ADHD diagnosis late in life, in my early 40s, if that's late. <laughs> uh, I uh, found out that I have a different brain wiring. So I went down the path of learning more about ADHD. I was fascinated by how our brain works and, and really my whole life made sense, Steve. I'm one of those that it was a light bulb moment of finally, I I, I now understand why I do the things that I do. 20 years in corporate Canada, did a lot of big things, a lot of big projects, and I stumbled through it and then I was successful through it. But then all along there was this feeling of something is off and I can't put my finger on it. And so with the ADHD diagnosis, uh, the understanding came. So what was it that felt off to you? Looking back, it's it's the the eagerness on jumping on new projects all the time, the impatience in team meetings where I'd be like, oh, I have something to share. Oh, I have something to share. And, and that excitement of wanting to jump in and do it all. Then looking back at, at in, in team meetings again, looking at my colleagues where they were all so poised and calm and quiet, take turn in talking where there's Kathy, bull in a china shop, coming in hot with the new idea. And then the frustration of, wait, why, why don't they like my idea? Isn't that what they hired me for? But why are they not accepting it? Because my foresight was way too far out for them and they, 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 they couldn't see why Kathy thinks like that. And how did she get there so quickly? So all th those little things, and th there's a lot more which we'll get into, of course. How did, how did the diagnosis change your relationship with, I guess, yourself in terms of how you saw yourself and also the way you saw work and interacted with work? You know, at the time when the diagnosis came around for me, I had just given birth to my baby girl and I was, she was my 40th birthday present, if you will. 
So at 40, I was at the the peak of my career in, in the corporate side. I, I worked in digital transformation, a lot of tech stuff going on. Loved it, was, was, was excited about it. And what came is, oh my gosh, I can do the career, I can do the family, I can do life. And now in motherhood, I, I got stuck. It was crash and burn. I was like, I, I just couldn't do one more thing. And so that understanding, the diagnosis gave me the understanding that it's not about me not being capable. It's just my brain has hit capacity. And that was a pretty big pill to swallow because I'm like, well, how do other mothers do it? How, how does everybody else do work, life, all of that stuff? So I, I guess that, that motherhood piece really was the part that with the diagnosis, there was more self-compassion. There was more self-acceptance. There was, ah, and here's an explanation of why I do the things that I do. Now, how do I work with it versus trying to work against it, trying to modify it? Okay, so let's follow up on that and, and sort of shift into the office space. And, uh, you know, why don't you help, help us understand how offices can better understand or support staff with ADHD or neuro, neurodiverse issues or experiences? As you know, like a lot of the workplaces aren't really set up for that and uh, don't naturally cater to people with these kinds of differences. What are some of the things that, that can be done in those places? Yeah, it's such a good question, especially in the workplace. How can how can they support those with ADHD? And I always say it starts with the tiniest, tiniest action, which is create containers where, where we feel safe in having a conversation. When I got my diagnosis and I told my colleagues, a few of my colleagues, I'm like, oh my God, I have ADHD. I was, I was one of those weird ones that was excited about it. But um, I heard the comment of, shh, don't tell anyone don't disclose too much. And I couldn't understand why. I'm like, well, but they hired me and they know my work ethics and they know what I do. What's the shame in that? So the, the stigma is very much alive to this day, I feel like, and that was six, seven years ago. So the stigma is there. The lack of understanding of what is ADHD and how does it show up in adults, right? Because there, there's that that's common... Uh, common theme of, well, it's for kids, they grow out of it. You're a successful adult. You've done all these amazing things. How could you even? So the, the stigma is definitely there. And I think the, it starts with conversations where you just come in and tell me about your ADHD. How does it look like for you, Kathy? Because you see one person with ADHD, you see one person with ADHD. And my version of it is so different than all the other people that I've met along the way. But what helps is a conversation that really is non-judgment. You're leaning in with curiosity. And please, for the love of God, don't tell us what to do. Explore with us how we can leverage this brain. I think that that's, it's, it starts from there. Fascinating hearing your, your, your journey and your challenge. And, you know, ADHD is, is an area that, here at MHS, we've worked with for close to 40 years. We've been involved in the identification uh, of it with both children and adults. So it's really, really fascinating for us to hear your journey and your self-discovery and, and how that influences things that you do at work. So what are some of the common problems that you've seen people at work have who discover, or even when they don't even know they have ADHD, what, what happens to them in their, their workplace? One of the common ones... Uh... When you have ADHD in the workplace, I mean, I mean, th th there's so many, and I don't want to generalize it. Uh, one could be this um, comparisonitis, as, as as we call them, where my colleague does it better than me, or you know, I I feel like there's a different way to do this, and my way is is the way, but it's not accepted. So there's this internal dialogue of meaning making that that folks may do, trying to compare themselves to the others. The other one is this imposter uh, talk that could come in is what if they find out? So we can mask pretty damn good. We can go in there, we can get the job done. But underneath, it's like, you know, the duck that's pedaling so fast to try to survive. But at the top, you know, it looks nice and smooth. That's how we show up. So that masking takes so much energy out of us throughout the day that by the time we get home, we're exhausted. We can't do the family life. Because all day we've been trying to keep it together so that we're not found out, if you will. So that, that's another common one. 
The other is this, this, the hustle culture, the productivity, do, 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 and trying to keep up with that. And I think with ADHDers, for some of us that have this cognitive hyperactivity, we become our own Achilles heel, if you will. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go. Yeah, it sounds like this masking can have physical ramifications as well as the sort of mental burnout, psychological ones. So it, it's, as you sort of alluded to, it's a pretty sensitive topic. Like, how do you approach, should, should leaders be looking out for it to talk to their people? Or should you uh, or an employee talk to their leader and say, listen, I have this this issue I want to talk to you about? Like, how does this, how does this get discussed between, you know, a, a, an online contributor or a contributor and their, and their supervisor? Love that question. And actually, because of that question, I ended up creating a leadership development course just on how do you have these kind of conversations and how do you support those with ADHD in the workplace? And a few things that we do within the program is, first, how do we create a container where there's empathetic listening going on without telling them what to do, without coming in with your own biases? So we talk about the cognitive biases of of, of what it's like to work with someone with ADHD. So they may assume that Sally needs headphone canceling, uh, noise canceling, and she'll do the job properly. But actually what Sally needs is a bit of ambiance in the background. She actually thrives in working in, in noisy environments. Believe it or not, some of us like that. So it's really making sure that these customized conversations take the pressure off of becoming an expert in neurodiversity and ADHD, you do not need to be. The person sitting in front of you is their own expert. But when you create the conversation and I, and what I love about the coach approach conversation, we lean in with curiosity. We lean in with, tell me more, tell me more. And what would that do for you if you had this? The minute we use the coach approach, then the conversation becomes easier. And, and you can really do that with anybody within the workplace and, and it benefits to the overall, you know, that I, I had this one client was like, all I'm asking for is an agenda item before going into a meeting. And I love you guys did that with me. You sent me your questions beforehand. So I knew what I was walking into. That gives me reassurance that, OK, they got it. They've done their homework. That in itself eases me so that I'm not sitting here in fight or flight going, oh, my God, what is Steve going to ask me next? So reducing that, that if there is ambiguity in the workplace, having these conversations, creating that psychological safety where they all feel like, you know what, my leader doesn't know any better than me. We're all in this together. I, I think that's the part the the coach approach model really does help leaders have conversations that comes from empathy, that has that psychological safety and really empowers the person to be like, I got this. And I've got my leader behind me motivating or inspiring me to do it. As we navigate the complexities of ADHD in the workplace, one crucial aspect often overlooked is the intersection with emotional intelligence. Kathy brings to light the importance of fostering empathic conversations and embracing curiosity. By creating a container for understanding without biases, we're not only empowering individuals, but also cultivating a culture of psychological safety. Can you speak a bit to some of the strengths that you've seen people you know, may display? 100%. And I love that you bring up the strength side of it. Within the strengths, and, and I'm one of those people, Steve, where I like to play the devil's advocate. I don't lean in too much to the superpower side of it because I know there's days when my ADHD gets the best of me and it just cripples me, right? And then it's like, okay, but I know how this brain now works. So let me lean into what does my recovery plan look like? Where before, without knowing how my ADHD worked, I would collapse for days, weeks at a time. So it's not, so it has its its strength and also the, the other side of it too. So on the strength side, in the workplace, what I see is innovative thinking, that divergent thinking, the outside the box that can come in. Uh, some of us may be a bit on the risky risk taking side, which actually is a good thing because yeah, let's see what happens. Let's explore. Another strength is is our um, hyper focus. 
So there's days where somebody can give you an output that usually would take three days to do. They'll do it in one day. So the the hyper focus is also, it can be a strength for us. It's a zone of genius where it comes out. Resiliency, that there is this side of us that are like, I, I'm, I'm doing this to the end. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm right there with you. So, so resiliency and, and tenacity that, that's within our community. There's empathy and loyalty. We are all about, what can I do for you, Steve? How can I make it better? So, so team environments, we really can thrive in it. And uh, finally, the entrepreneurial drive that that's, it's shiny new object. I have a new idea. Let me go down the path. We can bring all of that to the workplace. So there's quite a bit of strengths that that someone with ADHD can bring in. Wow. So so I take it that you've worked with a number of different organizations and companies. Um, what are some of the the common recommendations that you tend to make to uh, organizations company wide? A, a few things that we do is is actually supporting their, the individual employee in creating their own custom plan or their own custom approach to managing ADHD. So encouraging employees to be like, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. A job coach can really support those to really get in there and understand what they need. Just having containers of conversation. So one of the things we do is uh, I go in and have a workshop on just neurodiversity as it has a whole. What does it look like? What are the different aspects? And also really encouraging conversations to be had afterwards. So we come in, we do a talk, we come in, we do a five week workshop, but then what? So what I like to create is internal change agents or internal ambassadors of ADHD so that there's always somebody that they can go back to. And really supporting them to understand that this is not a, again, you don't have to be an expert in this, but what you can do is be an expert in creating conversations, which anybody can do. So those are some of the high level things um, that I encourage uh, em uh, employees to think about. If someone's working in an organization and somehow they discover that they maybe have ADHD or some uh, function that's different from others in terms of the way they think or approach things. What are some suggestions for them? How would they raise it with their manager or other employees? You know, what do, what do they do if they sort of feel stuck in their workplace? And, you know, this is the one that like, Kathy, I want to disclose, I want to disclose. But do you, do you have to, do you have to tie it to ADHD? What if, actually, I had this conversation in one of our group coaching the other day. She says, um, the way I go through things from A to B, I have a slow process. And I want to tell my boss that I have ADHD and, and that's why I have a slow process. But then the more we talked about it, was it because of ADHD or was it, and, and I always refer to my, my gender, that if I'm saying female, it's always Sally. Sally, what if, what if it wasn't about ADHD and this is Sally's creative way of thinking? So then I'm really going beyond the diagnosis, Steve, right? And going into the, the capability, the strength that that person has. Sally is very meticulous in the way she looks at things. And Sally's of the world are needed for when Kathy's of the world come in and go, let's run, Sally slows us down a bit. So that difference in processing and the way of thinking is so much needed. So Sally can just go to their, her boss and be like, you know what? Every time we've had a project where I'm slowing it down, the output has been amazing. We've had a high a ROI on this. So it's not about her ADHD, but rather honoring the way Sally processes information. So I talk about self-advocacy disclosure in a way of first, put yourself in first. And what is it about you that you need in that moment to do your job? And if you're a person that moves a lot, then you just need a stand-up desk so that you can move and think at the same time, ADHD or not, right? So it really empowers them to be able to self-advocate from a place of power, this is who I am, take it or leave it kind of a thing, versus because of my ADHD. And for me is I am Kathy, who has had a lot of different life experiences but and through it all, I've, I've figured out what's going on. Well, at least I'm still figuring it out, right? And that's my wish for my colleagues, for, for those in the workplace, is that, is through and through, who are you first? And then, by the way, you have this brain wiring that likes to trip you up from time to time. 
And how can you support yourself in that? And it sounds like, you know, the, the assessment process, the diagnostic process helps you sort of consolidate what it is I have or what makes me a bit different from others. But you don't stop there. It's not just a matter of getting a diagnosis. It's a matter of saying, okay, what can I do with what I've learned about myself, right? These things maybe get in the way of my work and these other things maybe enhance my work. So it's almost like you're focusing on what can I do more of to be more effective at work and try and, I guess, avoid or stay away from that diverts me from getting the work done. That's right. That's right. And you don't, it, it, it's, I like that the tools and the assessments that give you a bit of an explanation. And then it's work with a professional, work with a therapist, work with a coach to figure out what does your flavor look like for you. And also the, my, my biggest thing I would say is don't do ADHD alone because we can sit in rumination and catastrophization like it's nobody's business. But when you work with someone that can be your sounding board, that can be your thinking partner, then you can pull through and, and okay, here's a couple more steps we're going to do. Tell me, what, what advice can you give to managers who maybe are concerned about one of their employees isn't performing well or something? And we, and we know the issue may be that they're experiencing some, some difficulties with attentional problems. What would you tell the manager? I, you know, I, I see this often. And one of the first things it's uh, let's create a performance plan. Let's create a here are the things we're going to do and, and focus on the next three months or whatever. So now all of a sudden the person has a pip in front of them and it becomes intimidating because who came up with the plan? What were the high level things? What were the things that they were going to work on? And what was the, the approach? And I think the way to kind of counter that is before you create the plan, truly sit down with your with your employee and, and think about what are the areas that they are struggling with, but then quickly flip it to what are their areas of strength? Because I think we lean into this is not working, that's not working, that's not working, and we really forget about their areas of strength. So lean into the strengths first, amplify that in a conversation so that you create that safety so that they disarm, that their amygdala calms down going, this is not dangerous, they're with me, they're, they're on my side. And then through it, bring up the, and what are some of the areas that we want to work towards and, and, and uh, modify. And even with that is trial and error. If this doesn't work, what are we going to do next? And what, so experimentation. Actually, what I'd like to bring into this also is the agile project management approach. And in software development, we use that and they would, we would do things in sprints. You've got your end goal in mind, but then what can you do one week at a time? One week at a time. And it's an experiment. It's not written in stone. It's curious. It's informative. It, there's reevaluation that goes on. So really, when you start to create conversations like that, then you're not sticking to, well, Sally, it's been three months and you're still late at work. So that disarming that Sally can come up with her own plan that may work. So um, one of the questions we ask everybody at, at sort of the end of our, our interviews, uh, if you could describe the future of work in just one word, what would that work, word be for you? One word, Steve? How could you do this to me? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to make it easy. One word would be curiosity. Embracing. Uh, can I just say embracing curiosity? But give, me, give me two words. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Curiosity is a great word. So you see curiosity as, as one, of those, uh, one of those sort of uh, avenues of the future of work to be successful and, and what we need more of in the workplace. Yeah. Park your biases, park your assumptions. You never know what's going on with the other person. Come in curious. Come in with that beginner mindset and let people just show up as they are. Magic will happen. Great. Love it. That's a great way to think of, uh, of what we ought to be doing at work. I really appreciate that, Kathy. Really enjoyed having you on and, and learning more about your work and the things you do. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us in the conversation. Thank you so much, Steve. What a great opportunity. Thank you for what you do. It was such a pleasure having Kathy on the podcast. As leaders, we have to embrace change and ditch the this is how it's always been done mentality. I remember when I was starting my career back in the early 80s and was doing a research study with kids who couldn't finish their assessments. 
We put them on computers, and all of a sudden, they were excited about doing their assessments. In fact, they even asked to do more of them. Whether it's extending project deadlines or introducing something radical like computers in the office, we have to acknowledge that sometimes the problem lies in the process, not the people. Adapting our environments and expectations to meet their needs can really help us be so much more successful. Make sure to subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon for another episode of Work Therapy.